Hi guys, let's uh, proceed with our series on Azure DevOps today. Um, today I'm gonna um, uh, target projects or team projects and um, we'll kind of start with things, um, creating a new project in our um, created uh, DevOps organization from the last time. Uh, we'll talk about what the purpose of some of the settings is, um, what we do uh, on a regular basis, why we do it, and um, some first steps on repositories, uh, uh, which means uh, looking at the source code side of uh, team projects. So that's the part for today. Okay, um, let me, uh, with this set, just uh, switch over to um, my current organization, which is Coding Freaks. As I told you in the last uh, part, I just renamed it and removed the E in front of the Z. And now I'm logged in and I have an avatar here. And now I'm left here with uh, an empty organization in terms of project. There are no projects. And now um, our main part is to create a new project. So, and even the first setting is one which you can, you know, do something like uh, my first sample or whatever. But I don't want to skip this uh, right uh, in, in this uh, kind, because I think project naming is uh, a pretty underestimated step, um, because I, I saw a lot of organizations with messy project names all, all over the place. And uh, you end, often you end up with projects like, um, I don't know, um, something like, let's say, CRM demo, CRM app, um, I don't know, ERP integration system, stuff like that. And <clears throat> for several reasons, I think that's not a good approach. I know that people tend or developers tend to name stuff like um, they think what this stuff is doing. Um, the problem is, <clears throat> first of all, when the project begins, nobody knows if this is the CRM system often or the CRM to SAP adapter, whatever. Often projects tend to grow over time and uh, change their scope. So the bigger the project is, or the, the bigger the goals of the project is, the more like it is for the project to change its scope. So to come out of this situation, we can learn from big companies um, like Microsoft or Apple or uh, whoever you like. So what they do is they don't name their projects in the first place when they develop it or they do uh, R&D. They don't name it uh, for some target because this target is moving they come up with different namings. So let me show you what I mean by this, um, by uh, going to another slide. So a good advice, um, at least in production environments, um, is to do some kind of abstract naming. So what you see here in the screenshot is, um, that's um, a real project uh, DevOps uh, project overview from one of our customers is, uh, we convinced the customer to come up with a strategy how they name their projects. And what you see here is we have obviously plants or trees um, which uh, give the name for projects, which is like an alias. So the, uh, the customer here started with the project Oak um, and moved on with this uh, scenario. So every time we came up with a new project idea, we named it after a tree type. Uh, this gives us some uh, benefits because, you know, let's say Oak is some big project um, and uh, it's getting moment, momentum over time. So nobody complains about the name um, because it gets invalid more and more, uh, but sticks to the name. And now uh, what, what, of, what often happens is that people inside developing the project, stakeholders, developers, um, integration guys, whatever, they are naming their thing Oak and get a kind of a emotional relationship to this. Um, and outside the company or to the customers, everybody 
um, nobody knows, let me state it like that, nobody knows uh, that it's actually named Oak um, internally. So uh, this way you can separate things and you get a consistent uh, project overview. That comes with a price, of course, because you have to put effort in this. Um, <clears throat> so um, nobody uh, is able to just come up with a new project. Uh, you first have to make a decision inside of the team how to name it. And as you can see here, it's always a good idea, I think, to put even more emotional recognition into this by uh, adding logos to this, which is not so easy. Mm. And you don't have a logo all over the time. You see here, there was a project <laughs> when we started. And uh, after this, we got the naming convention. So my uh, advice would be to do stuff like this. Um, I just wanted to state this out be because, um, before we get for further. Um, in my company, which is DevDeer, we decided to have two strategies. The first is if technical people, most of them are guys, <laughs> as, as you might um, assume, um, they decided to come up with names from Star Trek universe, and other people in our company, um, we have a lot of uh, female colleagues, uh, they decided to come up with names from Disney. Uh, so that's, there is an um, incredibly big space of opportunities to get projects with. Okay, with this said, let me just step off this rule, <laughs> like in the first, because in this series I cannot come up with some logical thing here. I don't want to overstate this, but you got the point. So let me uh, say we have a, the first sample. We could name it differently, but let me go ahead and do this um, first sample. So just a quick demo for the... Uh, screencast could be a good um, description. So now you have to um, decide uh, the, uh, about the visibility. It's uh, kind of the same like in GitHub where you formerly had to pay for private repositories, uh, repor repositories which are only visible for people that are invited. It's kind of the same here. Um, most of the time we leave it private because um, when we do public repositories, we often go over to GitHub, as you might know, um, and uh, do it there. So then in the advanced uh, section, <coughs> you should uh, take a look here every, every time. Um, there's Git and TFVC, Team, version, uh, Team Foundation Version Control, which we um, do not use anymore. Um, we used it like five years ago or whatever the last time. <clears throat> and now we're doing Git. Um, I assume you will do it too. Um, then you have to decide what kind of project or a work item process template you want to use. Mm, I'll just... Um, just a few words here. There are four built-in uh, work item process templates. You can, as I mentioned in the last tutorial, you can uh, create your own work item process templates. Uh, we did this at DevDeer 2. I come up with this in later parts and um, just to, to have some example, let's uh, use Scrum. I will not overstate this because as I told you, I don't want to go into work items um, uh, in, uh, in a much great detailed way. Okay, let's create the project. It should take any long. That's normal. I'm glad that this happened. Um, that's because uh, he's too quick. So he wants to go uh, somewhere and it's, it's not there, as you can see here, he has this uh, GYD. Let's go to the home page and uh, relax because everything is okay. Uh, it's just because the new project wizard tries to get into the new project, like doing this deep link, but it's the GYD and he's uh, like overhauling itself. Okay, the first sample project now here, um, is ready for us. Uh, we will talk um, about this stuff in later parts, uh, like repositories, pipelines, test plans, stuff like that, artifacts. But let's start with just project settings. Because as the guy who creates this project, uh, this is your um, responsibility 
to set up everything um, in the correct way. Uh, so, um, uh, another interesting thing is that he switched my user account. But anyway, let me first of all uh, decide who the administrator is because I'm currently with my uh, work account here. I don't want it, this. Let me search for another user. I want to do it with my live ID. So uh, that's better. Um, and uh, now I'm, I have several project administrators and let's uh, do the sign. Uh, I'm currently with, I wanted to be with this account. Let's go over here and sign in. Yes. And let's see if we are still, oh, thanks for that. Dev Azure Com coding freaks. I don't know why he switched account. Um, to be honest, okay, that's better. Now I'm logged in here. Let's go to the first sample. Let's go to the project settings again. And as you can see now, I'm because I'm administrator, I can hit this. Um, okay, the overview brings you a lot of. Um, very important stuff. You can take a look at the uh, template which you decided. You can change the logo here or the, the avatar for the project. You can rename it even. Um, you can, as you've seen, uh, define administrators. And that's an important point here. Let, let's talk about this. You Basically what this says is you don't have to use every feature of uh, Azure DevOps provides for uh, every project. So it's totally uh, reasonable to say I want to set up my project like, um, uh, like I don't do it right now, but I want to remove the boards with it's basically the work item tracking, which if I remove the boards, uh, this gets kind of senseless because um, this work item process template mainly targets uh, the board and if I remove them, so this, set, uh, this setting will have no sense anymore. Um, I could remove repositories saying I don't want this DevOps project to provide, in this case, uh, Git services, um, but instead of this, I could decide to connect this project to let's say a GitHub project where, so that means the source code will lay in GitHub, but I will do work item tracking, pipelines, testing here in DevOps, and so on, so on. So if you already know um, what you don't want to use, you can switch it off here without any problem. You can switch it back on later without any problem too. Also on the overview, you have the deletion. Uh, option. We will see this later. So if you want to get rid of the project completely, this is the first uh, one of two uh, places where you can do it in the project itself. You also uh, can do the following. Let me show it. You go back to the organization, then to the organization settings, and then uh, you can take a look at the projects here. Now here um, it appears and you could delete the project from here too. Um, you also can create new projects from here too, if you want to. But anyway, let's go back to the project settings. So that's the main page and it's pretty interesting. Next thing, a few teams do this, but just to, to show you, you could go over here and uh, you see there is a team default option. Um, you could go over here and create new teams. So this is kind of confusing to people because this is a team project and we have the, the term team all over the place. But um, just to give you a first impression, uh, creating a new team means um, that you split your DevOps project into uh, groups of people. Um, one, mem one could be a member in several teams. The good thing about this is that you can uh, do something like separating your project, if it's a big project, let's say, in different parts. Like, let's say you have a UI team, you have a backend team, you have a designer's team, whatever it is. Um, so you get um, a better communication. You can separate things from teams so they don't get confused like different boards for different teams later on, stuff like that. We don't do this in the first uh, place, but one thing uh, project administrator creating a new project should do 
is to think about who is the member of the, who who are members of this team. So you can go uh, over here and uh, add people from and this is important from the DevOps organization to the team project. So why this is important is you can't add just member by mail address by inviting them directly here. Or oh, I, to be honest, I don't know if this is true. Meanwhile, um, can I? No, uh, it's true. Um, I just learned that it's still true. So all I can do is, as you can see here, currently um, this identity is member of the team, but the project administrator is not member of this team. He is, of course, member of the project because he's administrator. But in order to do it correctly um, and to say I'm not only an administrator, but I'm also, um, let's say, a co-worker, which means I, I have some role in the project. So um, this is, I can't overstate it because people don't get the point that they have sometimes, uh, let's say, invite people uh, at two at two areas. First of all, they have to invite them to the organization. That's always the first step. And then they have to assign them to teams in projects. Um, if they don't do it, you come in the portal and you, you can log in. That's because you, you've been invited to the organization, but you don't see any teams. So you're left with uh, basically a blank DevOps dashboard. Okay. In the settings here, you, uh, as you can see, you could have different avatars for different teams inside of the project, UI team and so on. As I told you, you can rename stuff here, uh, do description, which is more meaningful, and add administrators for the team. Um, as you can see, this kind of um, maps to the overview and this already points you to the direction to say a team is like a sub-project uh, in the organizational form of a team project. Okay, cool. Um, let's head over to security, uh, to permissions. So we've seen this in the first part, but with a different scope. Let's go over and do it side by side. So if we go here to permissions, um, and we put it on the side. You can, mm, that's not good. Yeah, I know. You can see here, it's basically the same UI, uh, left the project, right the organization, and what you see is different roles. So on the um, organization level, we have to decide who can do stuff in the organization and what he can do. And here in the project level, there are different roles um, uh, you can be member of. You can look at this from the groups or roles perspective or from the user's perspective. Uh, you can decide. So you could go here and uh, ask the question, so what is this identity capable of doing? So most of the time, you will not assign things directly to people. That's not a good idea, not only in DevOps. But you will see, uh, say, okay, I want him, this identity, to be the member of certain... Um, security uh, collections, let's call it this way. So uh, by making me a member of some group in DevOps, um, let's say build administrators, which is census because I'm already in the highest possible level, I talk about this. Uh, that's a better way to do this stuff um, than to do this, to do explicit um, uh, you know, um, rights management on identities. To step back, that, that was from the user perspective, the most common thing is to go here and um, ask the question, okay, who is a contributor, which means a project valid user without administrative uh, rights in this project? Who is member? No direct membership is seen here, which means we don't see identities, but we see that all members of the team are automatically mapped here to uh, project valid users, which is good. So that means uh, from the management perspective, we most of the time we don't have to deal with uh, stuff like that. We can just go to the teams and assign people to teams and 
the permission thing follows automatically. In the settings here, you can change uh, you you can change group images, but you don't do it here. You do it on another level because this is um, this is uh, um, uh, grayed out, as you can see. Uh, you can do this uh, on the organization level. Okay, cool. So uh, it's I think it's it's well done because you have here the summarization how many members are in which uh, role um, or group or whatever. I I like to call it roles. Microsoft likes to call it groups. I find this confusing because it gets um, it it get changed over certain places. Like Azure uses roles for that kind of stuff. I don't know. Uh, you even can create a new group um, here and uh, define your own set of rules doing this. Um, uh, I, I advise you not to overdo it because if this gets to kind of a convention and you have a lot of projects that you create, um, let's say one per month or something like that, you would have to overdo this over and over again in order to keep... Um, uh, in a consistent way. It, it's always the same with me, site uh, talk. Um, I'm a guy and uh, so is Coding Freaks naturally <laughs> because I'm the guy <coughs> who, who loves consistency and who always seeks to uh, uh, find solutions which are um, making something like a standardized way. Uh, I think it's an important thing to come over to system governance, to um, uh, to professionalization of, of stuff. And that's why I love um, consistency so much. And that's why you have to hear it all over the time. Okay, notification again is something which we have seen already um, uh, here on the, um, on the blade of the organization. Here you can see the global notifications which we can put uh, on and off here um, or remove and now you see um, the um, diverting settings here for uh, the teams uh, for the project here you can switch them on and off and you have here uh, delivery settings or uh, so you could decide to do it for every member or you can have like a collection mailbox or even just um, switch it off to say don't deliver it uh, to, a to anybody who says what's the sense of this because that is um, that smells like switching it off completely that's not true because <clears throat> by default um Email is the delivering uh, system. And what you will see later on, uh, you can hook into those, let's call it events um, with other systems. And then you could decide to do it, let's say in Teams or whatever. And that could be uh, a point to avoid email clutter, to just uh, switch it off. So at, as a project admin, to just um, decide for the team we don't want to use email as our communication channel but we want to have notifications so this is like devops um, uh, sh should create the event when a pull request re reviewers are added or removed he, he should do this but switching it off here means don't send an email uh, if this happens okay Next interesting thing is the concept of service hooks. Mm, we have to talk about this. So service hooks, I think this is uh, not a correct, a completely correct description of what service hooks can do because it seems like um, it only can react to events in the project, which is not totally true, I think. Uh, so just uh, go in and look what Microsoft has here. So if you go to create a subscription, uh, what this basically says is I have a known list of installed already known services which are outside of DevOps. So if you don't know what AppWare is, so probably you will don't need it or Azuqua or whatever. Um, um, a thing which is um, pretty famous, of course, is Office 365. Um, and Microsoft Teams is um, pretty clear too. There are... Uh, like here, there are some things which are kind of doubled because either you are communicating over Teams or you do it in Slack. It's kind of rare that you do it on both sides. 
So this is kind of this or that and uh, Office 365 and blah, blah, blah. And behind all this default service hooks, there's uh, a certain set of events each of those services um, provides. So let's go over to Teams, let's say Teams, go to the next pane. And um, here you can see that they say you have to, to do it um, on the, uh, in the opposite direction. You don't um, integrate Teams by integrating it here, but you please go over to the Teams administration and integrate DevOps into Teams. Okay, that, that is because it has changed over time. And I think Microsoft wants to advertise the feature that Teams is able to be put in. Let's go to another uh, thing, which is user voice, um, because Microsoft uh, DevOps or Azure DevOps is um, often has, um, uh, you can say, the feeling that it's targeting more technical users or people um, who are um, pretty uh, used to do uh, agile programming uh, and project development. On the other side, it is not a good idea to invite your um, maybe millions of uh, customers as stakeholders into the DevOps organization for obvious reasons. It's a management nightmare. So user voice as uh, user voice is just a service you can you you have to pay by your own is one possibility to keep in track with the feedback of your users and to allow you to do stuff as a devops can like ticket system um, i want a feature requests from from outside i want to integrate the user feedback into my app maybe stuff like that and now you could go over and say, I want, you know, I don't want to have two management systems. I want that user voice, let's say tickets, end up somehow in my backlogs here in Azure DevOps. So that would be a good idea to do user voice. Um, and now um, uh, <laughs> it's the same thing. Uh, I don't know what, why this happens. Let me see if something is happening. Uh, let me go over here. Yeah. Uh, and when we go to another step like Jenkins, now it's working. As you can see, it's evolving. Uh, the last time I visited it, it was possible from here. So now it's not because user voice has the opposite integration like Microsoft Teams. But in Jenkins, you can do it, obviously. Next. And then you can, uh, it's, it's providing a, a certain um, feature step like triggers from DevOps at this time. And then you can filter them and then you can decide, okay, this is going over to Jenkins. This feature, if you ask me, service hooks, is getting less and less important um, because you see it's a list here. So obviously Microsoft when they invented this, plan to uh, this thing to be growing, and it's not happening uh, after several years, really. However, you can go to every time to the Azure Marketplace here on the top. That's important to uh, say too, and you could search for hooks um, to think about: Can I integrate it somehow into my DevOps organization, like Datadog? And but what you see too is those two are already integrated. You've seen them. You don't have to do anything here. Um, I honestly don't know what this is from Richard Fennell and Datadog. It's kind of special too. Um, and 38 downloads is not that much. So what I want to say here is I think the concept of service hook uh, kind of um, died out. That's what I'm saying here. We don't use it very often. Okay. Then we are still in the settings. Go to the dashboards. And basically here you don't set up dashboards here. You define what uh, team members or team admins um, um, can always create dashboards. And you define what people um, of the team can do. Can they create, edit and delete dashboards? Yes or no? So that's kind of a permission, additional permission thing. Okay. Um, as I told you, I won't talk a lot about boards uh, again. Uh, so this is um, because work item tracking is kind of special point. Interesting is here the GitHub connections, which many people do. So if you say, um, <laughs> that the pull request uh, 
should uh, should be let's say you have the work item here in Azure DevOps, but you have the source code in GitHub. So at some point, it could be interesting to you um, to decide. Okay, there's a pull request from one branch to another in DevOps, uh, in excuse me, in GitHub. So I will connect this um, over to GitHub. It's like a service hook, um, but more. And then you have still the connection between what happens in GitHub um, and to your work item user stories, for instance, and stuff like that here. Okay. Um, let me talk about this stuff a little bit. Mm, you, you can see the group now we are on pipelines. Uh, as you can see here, there's no setting for source for repos um, because you set this up basically using Git uh, technologies. Let's see, uh, we see, oh, it is here. <laughs> <laughs> just said it and now I'm mistaking but we will hit this later and um, I won't talk about this now because we have certain uh, parts of this uh, webcast series which are hitting pipelines later um, interesting may might be this uh, SAML build services and what it is mm, to explain it and we will cover it later too but um, Microsoft Dev Azure DevOps decided to uh, rely on a new language which de are defining our pipelines, uh, which is YAML. Um, it's this, basically the same format uh, other services nowadays use, like uh, Docker uh, is based on YAML. But uh, Azure DevOps um, is inheriting stuff from older um, parents, which are team foundation servers, stuff like that. And they invented, I, I think, in the version 2.0, 2010, Microsoft invented a new definition system for build pipelines, which was based on XAML, which was at this time the uh, hype stuff. So this basically is there and you don't uh, need it very often. If you not know what XAML is, you can skip this part. And you just uh, are able to add here a connection to a XAML build service, um, basically saying DevOps, I'm doing the old stuff and here it is. That's what you do here. I just stated this one out because a lot of people don't know what it is. The other parts are always kind of straightforward to them, but they are asking me, what is this? Uh, do I need this? No, um, most of the time not. Um, another interesting point is here the storage settings, um, which is um, interesting because of the cost management. I told you uh, uh, last time that the cost basically scale with the users you have uh, depends on um, um, the, the license you select for the users. Another thing where you could create costs is storage of artifacts. So what is this? Um, an artifact is whatever remains when you have a build process out of the pipeline um, then something remains, like it could be a setup package, it could be a bunch of DLLs or zip files or whatever you would like. Um, it is the, the thing which actually is the deliverable um, that your project creates, whatever it is. So this needs to get stored somewhere and um, Azure DevOps has its own storage and normally you are limited to, I think, two gigabytes uh, of storage. Of permanent storage. If you go beyond this, um, you have to pay. It's pretty rare that you go belong it because you need kind of a bigger project and the storage is not stacking up because you have retention uh, on storages. Uh, you will see this later um, on, um, like it's here on releases, release retention. Okay, let's take a look now. So normally you don't keep all your releases or you lease at artifacts, um, and, but you have retention policies, those are the default uh, policies, and so you can decide what to do here. Uh, so this shouldn't be that important for you, I just wanted to um, explain it. And here is a point where you can, um, first of all, take a look how much you um, have stored, um, uh, total storage summary, uh, not your, how much you uh, have stored, but how much you have stored beyond the limit, the total billable stored. Okay, you have analysis here, links, you can take a look at this, but you should not hit this point in normal scenarios. 
I don't go into test retention right now because instead of this, I now want to head over um, to the project itself. Uh, what is this? Uh, let me refresh my screen. Thank you. Uh, now we have everything set up. We have two members here. Um, we have no stats. Uh, logically, we have um, everything in place because we decided to don't um, delete one of the features. And we now talk, talk about uh, the first thing, which is repositories here and talking about what we're doing here. Okay, <clears throat> basically what this dialog is, um, uh, wants to say uh, you, to you is that there is no repository initialized currently. You only see this if this is uh, true. So there are several options, four of them, to uh, initialize something. You could um, uh, start by cloning it uh, somehow um, on your computer, do stuff and then uh, do a first pull and that will create uh, a branch, a new one, and then you get started. You uh, could use command line to say I have something already on my local disk and now I want to uh, just um, uh, push it here or to add a remote. A remote at this time, the remote will be Azure DevOps Git. And uh, so you could uh, create a new one. Uh, you could import a repository from another repository um, doing this button. But the most common step is to, um, for me at least, is to create um, uh, freshly by creating a new master branch. You can, by the way, um, decide what the name of your first branch normally is in the, in the settings. But let's uh, stick with master, which is kind of um, common to git. And you can decide to add or not add a readme, which is a markdown file. Um, I'll leave it uh, here on the default. And the good thing, which you might know from GitHub and other repositories too, is um, just to start with a git ignore file. The git, the git ignore file, from, for those who are not knowing what this is, it's a git feature and it's a special file telling git what kinds of files and folders not to include or to include into um, the source control. So uh, Microsoft uh, just created uh, some samples, for instance, for Visual Studio. Because Visual Studio has some special folders like the dot solution folder, um, uh, this is already known, if you will, by this file. When you select it, let's do it. And you just hit initialize and it's kind of a uh, fast process and now what you got here is um, you are presented with the only branch you have currently which is master you can see it here you have one branch and uh, <coughs> you see he brought in a readme template here um, which is kind of practical for beginners because you get like a structure what you should do and a git ignore file let's take a look at this which is basically saying those kind of patterns and direct file names, folder names and whatever uh, will not be included like this one into source control. So when you build locally, this says when you build locally, uh, all the common folders um, which are known uh, to be folders in Visual Studio solutions will be ignored. Those will be ignored um, so that no build results are um, committed into or pushed into your repository later on. Um, it's kind of big and you can, um, if you want certain files to be included, you could do this with uh, the git ignore change here. So whatever. Uh, branches, by the way, are uh, shown here in a more detailed view. This confuses people because often they stick with this view and they think, oh, there is one branch and that's it. That's not true that are your branches. So you means the user who is here. So those branches are shown here, which are interesting for some reasons to you. Um, to get an overview of all branches, oh, don't forget to go to the all uh, tab here. But uh, with this in mind, so what, what, we do we, what do we do next? So this is not um, special to Azure DevOps. It's like a Git uh, thing, what we do now. So here's a clone button which gives you this URL. So before you just go over here, or let me show you, I just copy it out and I go over to my console. And let's say 
I have a subfolder coding freaks here and let's say I just do git clone and this. So that's okay. He should do it. So he's cloning first sample into the folder structure and we go to first sample and uh, take a look at this and we see exactly what we see here. And we already can uh, do, uh, do, do things. When I go over, I don't know if this works. Yeah, it's working. And when I go over and do stuff, okay, it's already up to date. So let me go ahead and change, let's say, the readme. Let me head over to Visual Studio Code in the folder. And let's uh, change something in the readme file. Uh, my release note, thank you for this. Thank you for this too. Introduction, and let's say, I know what, I'm good. Just remove this stuff. Um, hello. And save it. And now let's go over to the command line and say, what's my status? Okay, git commit minus m uh, readme. Um, get uh, push everything up to date oh no um, get at uh, I just forgot everything get push everything up to date git commit minus m um, read me oh thank you let clean it again status your branch is master and I'm ahead of original master by one commit. Now I got it. Thank you for this. And now do a push and he's doing it. And that's first of all kind of strange um, because let's, let, let's take a look what happened now. If I go to the master branch and see the history, I can see here that I committed it, but take a look at this. I'm committing it using not my Coding Freaks account, but some other account, which is this DevDLX account, which, where, where does it come from? So the question is, how is the security uh, done here in, in Git? So in order to answer this, you have to take a look at a certain file, which is um, in your user folder. Uh, it's, it's not, again, it's not DevOps I'm uh, talking about, it's, um, uh, it's Git. So, but it's important to work with Azure DevOps. So let's go here and uh, take a look at the at a folder which should be the .git folder. I don't see it. Uh, where is it? Where is it? Um, let me take a look. Uh, so there it is. And now here you. Uh, see the reason why he's using uh, this account. So this is basically my work or school account, which I added to my local um, settings so that the git command line knows what to do. Okay, cool. So if as long as this user is uh, somehow um, authorized to do, which is true, uh, this will work. So what happens when you go here with something else, not git a command line, but something else. Let's talk about this. So what I show you now is I'm, as you might expect, because you saw me struggling with the console, right, five minutes ago, I'm over uh, a lot of times I'm using this tool. Um, don't judge me, I don't like it. Uh, I, I just like it. Um, and uh, I'm just opening a repository, go to my repos and find the first sample here. And that's basically showing me all the stuff, which is um, kind of cool when I do a lot of projects. It, it gives me like a visual experience. I like it. So what happens when I go and fetch here and all of a sudden here, something strange happens. So he says, you know what? I can't do it because he this system is not the Git console. It's not using all um, the .git um, uh, configuration. It has its own storage of credentials. So now we have a problem. So I could go here and say, you know, my ID is codingfreaks at live.de, which is my um, live account or Microsoft account. And now I can go here and let me just open my key pass and find my, my password. 
which is this one, and go log in, and he's saying no. This is basically the Git Kraken way of saying no, no, no. So why is this? Let's head over here to the DevOps. Um, he already told us to create Git credentials over, over the place. So what is this? Um, I, I shown you this in the first um, part. Uh, this is basically the step here on the bottom. So I'm logged in into this portal using my Life ID or Microsoft account, but that has nothing to do with the way the repositories are authorized because this is relying on Git. So Microsoft is separating this, which is basically good. So now I can go over here and uh, go to the section personal access tokens or SSH, uh, SSH public keys. So basically you decide what kind of authorization methods you like to use. Let's skip over this. SSH public keys is kind of the default way people do it when they are using Git. Um, um, because they generate a uh, public-private key pair and uh, telling um, after this uh, DevOps, this is my public key, and then they uh, configured Git locally to use uh, with the private key of this pair, and then everything happens just magic magically. Um, currently, uh, more and more people and systems go over to personal access tokens, which are, if you will... Um, <clears throat> like passwords, but uh, the password is uh, not a username password combination as you know it, like it, it gets old and um, uh, or it, it, is, it is linked to a user directly. It's just a token um, which you can give a name, which is not important. Let's say that's my PAT for coding freaks and organization is coding freaks you can go over and say i want this personal access token to be valid for all accessible organizations i know um, i don't do this let's say 30 days um, maybe 60 days is okay the less you do this this time span the better from the security perspective it is and the more often for you have to uh, change it or uh, you know this and now you can exactly decide what somebody who knows this access token which comes out here can do with this token. And that's kind of cool because you could have several access tokens for, your, uh, for you um, and, and, and use this all over the place for tools and whatever. And um, I can say, you know what, this is only for Git Kraken. Let's say, or for um, Git tooling okay and now i say uh, i want full access for code i just leave out this just full access here uh, or it's just status i just want to use it to read on the status but anyway it's a source code pat so there are more scopes uh, you could define those those are the normal ones uh, you should not do the full access um, here on tokens it's kind of dangerously uh, and you should always keep track what you're doing here. So let me create my first personal access token, which ends up in this key. And let me use it. I copied it out in Git Kraken here. Kind of doesn't matter what this says. Login. And now he's good. This tool is good. So let's head over here and change. Let me go here. This is my repository. Let's change this using another tool. Read me. Here it is. Hello world. Okay. And now just use this tool and say, okay, I have a change here. Thank you. Um, edit, uh, read me stuff, whatever. Uh, stage the file, commit the change. And now I have an outgoing commit. I'm one ahead and let me push it. Just to, yeah, it was pushed successfully. And now let's take, let's take a look at our history again. As DevOps, first sample, repos, branches, uh, history. And uh, now I'm still Defty Alex, which is interesting because um, he's kind of get things mixed, but I used my other personal access token. As you can see from the personal access token, he's not automatically der deriving, well, that's this user. 
um, he's still taking this tool is still taking stuff from the local git installation like the name the alias um, which is kind of confusing but that's not the blame uh, of uh, the git integration of um, azure devops as far as it is concerned everything is correct because he knew somehow the personal access token which is my problem because i mixed stuff so you have to be very, very careful here and set up your local environment. But I wanted to show you how to get um, things working. Okay. Um, now that we have this, it's time to do some more stuff. So let's take uh, the branches <clears throat> and let's um, talk about, um, well, how you do things. You could allow stuff like I just did uh, um, pushing directly to the master branch, which is in professional projects is kind of unusual because the master branch is kind of holy um, or should be. So <clears throat> what we could we do instead, we create right in front of it uh, a new branch from the master branch at least. And let's say we call it initialization uh, work. So we create a branch which currently is basically a copy of master. And now uh, doing this just don't um, brings you anything. The thing you have to do in the next is you go here and create a branch policy. So a branch policy basically says what are the condition that anybody is allowed to make changes on the master branch in, in this case. So <clears throat> because I'm demoing here stuff, I just leave this out. This is not a good idea. Um, but I could do something uh, pretty simple and say, okay, what, uh, you know what, I want uh, to be sure that any push to master has at least a comment um, uh, uh, on it, um, have been resolved on pull requests or whatever. So that says, um, if we do this in uh, terms of a pull request, which is basically what I'm, what I'm saying here, to enable branch policy says, basically I need a pull request to make changes on the master branch. So what this says is, if there are any open commands from other people um, or from myself on this pull request, it should not go through. Uh, this thing here is pretty interesting. We uh, cover this in later parts because we say we only want to allow pull requests to be happening on master if at least one work item from this area, from the board, from the board is linked to this pull request. We can't do it here right now. So what we also will say, it's kind of senseless now, I want to have reviewers, minimum one. Uh, and now for the demo purposes, I switch on this, which says um, I can approve my own changes too. So now this makes a little bit of sense, but you have to grasp the idea, which is, you want to have more eyes looking on this. That's the intention of a pull request. And you don't want to just allow anybody to make changes on the master like this. Later on, we will uh, cover build validation and status checks. What is this? Uh, so you end up basically doing this. You end up with continuous integration, saying that when a pull request happens, besides all those checks, which are human checks, if you will, or work item checks, you will say, well, no matter what happens, uh, this build has to build, uh, the source code has to build in order to get to the uh, master branch later. Okay, with this in place, we can uh, try uh, change uh, once more, because currently, I am on the master branch, so I could go here and say, uh, try it. Save this guy, go over to my tool here again, view the change, there it is, stage it and say, uh, just another change here and commit this. This was locally. And now I'm just pushing it directly to master and he's saying no. You can't do this because master is secured right now um, and you get a certain error message, TF42455, which is Team Foundation, interestingly. It's not Azure DevOps because this is a heritage of TFS. So anyway, it's working. So I can't do this. What I can do is um, I can set back uh, to this one uh, again 
Um, so he's already existing and I go to this, check out this commit. Um, okay, and I go over to initialization work here and I could do the change here and then push it. So let me do this. Um, when I go over to my tool, it has, yes, it has lost this. Try it, save, view change, change readme. Okay, commit and push. Because I can push to initialization work, that's valid. So now what I have now, I have two branches, both of them are mine. Um, I updated this one just uh, right now. So he's uh, already understanding a little bit, understanding in double quotes, what is going on and suggesting to make a pull request. And now uh, I can go here and take a look of it, um, what, what's going on. And then I can create a pull request in several places um, from here to master. So let me do this. Create a pull request. He's saying, you know what? This is your source. This is your target branch. Um, he's taking the commit because only one commit happened. So he's suggesting, you know what? Change this. Uh, um, take this. I will do it. And I will do uh, this. I add myself as a reviewer explicitly, which is not... Um, you have, you have not to do it, but I just want to show you. And then I create it. And now I'm left with this. So this is the pull request dialog. We'll cover this later on. I set autocomplete and say no, just if this PR uh, comes through, uh, don't delete anything and don't complete anything. It's just completed the PR. Okay, cool. And now one check, uh, which which this thing is waiting for, is that one reviewer must approve. And I can take a look at the files and say, okay, that's cool. That's it. I am check it. And then I say approve. And now this thing is through. After some seconds. And when we go back to the branches, we see that this change made it to the master branch which is good. So um, the interesting thing about this, why I bring it up in this early stage of my series, um, I, I consider the branch policies here to be a very, very first step because you in the, in the, in the, in the earlier stage of our project, I already say nobody is allowed to change just like that master. And it's a good thing to do it right away. So you force people to create branches in which strategy, I, I don't um, set this, that is not a strategy, that is just a branch. We will cover strategies later. And now you force people to do whatever they want to do on different branches than on master. So you protect your master kind of right away. So that was um, uh, very, very important at this place. And with this, I want to... Um, stop here and um, uh, to just recap what we did. We created in Azure DevOps a, a project. We just covered some of the basic settings of the project, like administrators, uh, what services we want to use. Uh, a very um, important point is to invite members, the correct members to the team so that everybody can participate. We have looked at permissions um, at possible other settings, not all of them. We'll cover them later. And then we went over and did the minimum stuff, initializing um, a single branch, the master branch, in, uh, including an ignore file. And then we just um, said, okay, we want uh, to uh, take a look at how can we um, secure our master branch. So at this stage, kind of the project is set up so we can work on. See you next time.